Welcome to the Dup Dive. Today we're plunging into, uh, well, it's quite an enigma, an object that seems to just defy the known timeline of human civilization. We are talking about the Buga sphere. Right. And for listeners who maybe haven't seen the pictures, imagine a small, dense sphere, supposedly metallic, found inside this uh, thick layer of organic resin. Yeah, like amber almost. Sort of, yeah. And it's that resin, the stuff around the sphere, that gave this absolutely spectacular date we need to talk about. Exactly. So our mission today, what you've asked us to do, is give you a quick but, you know, thorough understanding of this single, really astounding carbon-14 dating result, and also the huge challenge it poses to archaeology, and importantly, the, uh, the skepticism needed when looking at how it was presented. Okay, let's just lay out the main finding right away. The C-14 dating of that resin, the organic part, done by a reputable U.S. lab, puts the age at approximately 12,560 years old. 12,560 years. And that number, I mean, it's like an archaeological cannonball, right? It just lands this thing way outside the conventional timeline for any known civilization having the tech to make something like this sphere. It really does. It implies there was some kind of sophisticated presence on Earth back when, well, when the consensus says our ancestors were basically nomadic hunter-gatherers. Nothing more complex. So where does this specific dating result actually come from? Who's putting this number out there? That's critical here. It was publicized by Dr. Stephen Greer. He cites work done by the University of Georgia's Center for Applied Isotope Studies. So you have, on one hand, a scientifically respected source for the raw data, the lab itself. But the data got released through a, let's say, highly non-traditional channel. Okay, and that's where the tension really starts, right? That's what we need to unpack. So let's spend the first part focusing purely on the science, the weight and context of that date itself. Then, uh, then we'll tackle the controversial figure who brought it out. Sounds good. Let's dig into the science of 12,560 years ago. Now, C14 dating, it's a robust method, especially for organic material like resin. And the University of Georgia's lab, the Center for Applied Isotope Studies, they're definitely a high-quality facility, no question there. So when they produce a number that precise, 12,560 years, we have to take that seriously, scientifically speaking. You really do. It suggests this sphere got stuck in that resin during uh, what we call the early Holocene transition, basically the tail end of the Ice Age. Okay, but hang on. Here's a critical question for me and probably for you listening. If a top lab produces a result that like literally rewrites human history, I mean, a result challenging everything archaeology tells us, why are we hearing about it from someone involved in UFOs in a press release instead of, you know, Nature or Science magazines? That's exactly it. Doesn't the source of the release kind of taint the finding right off the bat, no matter how good the lab is? That is the core conflict you have to grapple with here. The quality of the lab data is one thing. The Let's call it the motivation behind its public release is entirely another. However, if we just stick to the science for a moment, that age, while startling, isn't completely out of left field in terms of dating ancient organic stuff. Oh, uh, really? How so? Well, our sources point to similar work uh, back in 2014 in the Near East, Scientists there successfully dated very old resins. It proved that resin can preserve its chronological signature for thousands, even tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea of dating ancient resin, that's validated. Okay, so the method isn't the crazy part. It's the result in this context. And if we zoom out again, that time frame, 12,560 years ago, that's historically really interesting, isn't it? Because it lines up almost perfectly with uh, one of the biggest climate shifts Look, ever. Absolutely. You're talking about the end of the last glacial maximum, the LGM. Right, the LGM. And for anyone not familiar, the LGM was basically the peak cold snap of the last ice age, the absolute furthest the ice sheets reached. Its end, the period this date falls right into, fundamentally reshaped the whole planet. Ice sheets melted, sea levels shot up, environments just completely transformed rapidly a time of massive environmental stress. And that period, it's also known for being tricky for dating, isn't it? For C14 dating specifically. Oh, definitely. The end of the Ice Age is one of the most challenging times for getting precise C14 dates, mainly because the whole environment was in flux. During the LGM and its end, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere and oceans, the carbon reservoir, was bouncing around like crazy. Why was that? Massive shifts in ocean currents, huge amounts of meltwater from the ice sheets pouring into the oceans. It just disrupted the whole carbon cycle. So earlier C14 work, before we had really sophisticated calibration curves, often made things at the end of the ice age seem older than they actually were. 
Ah, okay. So if the University of Georgia lab is giving this precise number now, 12,560 years, hmm. it probably means they're using the latest modern calibration methods that account for those known issues, those uh, C-14 hiccups from the Ice Age melt. Exactly. That's what it suggests. It shows the method itself has evolved and can refine these major historical timelines. I mean, if C-14 dating can now help us pinpoint exactly when massive ice sheets melted, it certainly has the technical chops to date a sample of organic resin accurately. Yeah. The sheer precision of the date they gave, 12,560 years, that's kind of a scientific statement in itself, saying we accounted for the complexities. Okay, okay, let's pivot then. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, the science is sound. The lab did its job. The date is accurate. We have a 12,560-year-old artifact in resin. This is where it leaves the lab bench and, well, explodes into speculation, right? We have to ask, who or what made this thing? Right. Because the date creates what we call a technological discontinuity. It just shouldn't be possible based on our standard model of human development back then. This leaves us with basically two main competing ideas, two hypotheses that our sources lay out for this whole puzzle. Okay, what's hypothesis number one? Hypothesis one. The sphere was made by a highly advanced but currently unknown ancient human civilization right here on Earth. A culture that flourished during the Ice Age, had the technology to make precision spheres, and then vanish, may be wiped out by the climate changes, leaving very few conventional traces behind. Like a lost civilization Atlantis style, but potentially real. Something like that, yeah. That's one possibility the date forces us to consider however unlikely it might seem based on current evidence. Okay, and hypothesis number two. Hypothesis two. The sphere is not human-made at all. It's an extraterrestrial artifact. It was left here, dropped here, who knows, by some off-world visitors or probe thousands of years ago, not made on this planet. Right. And this is where we absolutely have to bring in the messenger again, Dr. Stephen Greer. Yeah. Why his involvement is just so critical for you, the listener, when you're evaluating this stuff. Yeah. Dr. Greer, he's a retired emergency room doctor, but his public career for decades now has been as a ufologist. It's really essential background. He founded organizations like CSETI, that's the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and he leads the Disclosure Project. And what's the goal of those groups? What are they trying to do? Their stated goal is to actively research and uh, really push for governments worldwide to release classified information about alleged extraterrestrial contact and technologies, UFOs, basically. Yeah. So this context is absolutely key. Dr. Greer's life's work, his whole public platform, is built on proving ETs are real and are interacting with Earth. Okay. So, when a person whose entire mission is disclosure of ET contact presents us with two options for the sphere, a lost ancient civilization or an ET artifact, yeah. well, his history strongly suggests he has a preferred answer, right? A counter bias towards the ET explanation. You have to assume that, yes. So we have to view the information through that lens, even if the raw lab data itself is perfect, untouched. We've got to separate the data quality from the delivery motive. Precisely. And that context leads us straight to the major scientific caveat. And frankly, it's a massive one. The crucial lack of peer-reviewed replication. This is Science 101, right? The safety mechanism against extraordinary claims. A single C-14 date, no matter how interesting or how carefully measured by one lab, it's just an opening remark in a scientific conversation. It's definitely not the conclusion. Think of it like, um, like tracking a stock. You see one company's stock price suddenly shoot up one day, a huge spike. You don't immediately declare the company's future as guaranteed gold, or that the whole market's rallying, right? No, of course not. It could be anything, a rumor, manipulation, a one-off event. Exactly, you wait. You wait for a sustained trend. You wait for independent analysts to verify why it surged. Was it real? Was it a fluke? It's the same here. Until multiple independent labs, labs chosen without any input from Dr. Greer or his associates can take samples of that same resin and replicate that 12,560 year date. Well, the findings simply cannot and should not be accepted into the official historical or archaeological record. And you'd think if this were truly validated and peer reviewed, the scientific community would be all over it. There'd be conferences, papers, research grants flying around. Absolutely. The fact that we're seeing it promoted primarily by an activist figure rather than debated in academic journals tells you where it currently stands in the scientific process. It warrants intense skepticism, even if the result itself feels potentially groundbreaking. It's the whole vetting process that's missing right now. The initial data point is, yeah, it's exciting, it's provocative. But until that data is independently verified and the methods are laid bare for rigorous critique by people who don't have a dog in the fight, people who don't already want it to be ancient aliens or a lost civilization, it just remains a really fascinating outlier, a question mark. 
Okay, so wrapping this up, what does this all mean for you, the listener? Trying to get informed quickly on this. We're left with this really potent tension, a potentially world-changing scientific number, 12,560 years coming out of a reputable lab, but pushed into the public eye by someone with a very clear, very well-documented agenda and critically lacking that independent scientific confirmation. And the implication, if, and it's a big if, if this dating is eventually confirmed, yeah. it goes way beyond just pushing back the date for fancy tech. Yeah. It means there was some kind of sophisticated presence, whether it was homegrown earthlings or ETs, existing right at the chaotic end of the last glacial maximum. That is just huge to think about. This culture, or whatever it was, didn't just exist a long time ago. It existed during, and maybe even survived, one of the most violent, rapid climate shifts in recent geological history. We're talking about navigating, potentially, a period of mass environmental collapse on a global scale. Yeah, which brings us to maybe a final thought, something provocative for you to mull over. We know there are complexities, known issues, with C-14 dating right around that period, the end of the Ice Age. Calibration is crucial. But perhaps the real hurdle here isn't just getting the definitive date for the sphere. That's potentially doable, scientifically. So what is the real hurdle, then? It might be overcoming the profound bias and in interpretation that inevitably comes with it, whether that bias is the archaeological establishment's understandable reluctance to accept anything complex before known cultures like Clovis, mm -hmm. or, on the other side, an equally strong, uh, perhaps unwavering belief in an extraterrestrial explanation pushed by figures like Greer. So the data might just be data, but the story we tell about it. Exactly. The data is what it is. But the narrative we build around it the story we choose to believe based on who's telling it and what we already think. Hmm. That's where the truth, or at least objective understanding, risks getting completely lost. You, the listener, have to weigh the source against the science and decide which story holds water for you right now, pending more evidence. 